Good evening, brethren. Almost 20 years ago, I presented a paper entitled The American Doctrine, a Concept Under Siege, to the members of Virginia Research Lodge Number 1777 in Richmond, Virginia. On this occasion, I want to share with you the thoughts addressed in that paper, modified by developments that have occurred over the past two decades. In this presentation, I will reiterate my long-term interest in the way and manner that Grand Lodges exercise jurisdictional power by custom, practice, and law. Grand Masters and Grand Lodges have assumed, allocated, and implemented almost unlimited authority to the end that Masonic organization and operation have taken on near monopolistic, if not near oligarchic characteristics. Seemingly, moreover, the resultant unique system has been subject, for the most part, to only minimal challenge. In consequence, Grand Lodges have become powers within themselves, answerable on occasion to the membership, but free, by and large, to rigidly control and protect their interests within the confines of proclaimed jurisdictional limits. In furthering this conception of power, it has been a common practice for Grand Lodges to declare sovereign authority over all Masons and all Lodges within their purview, and in some instance even to claim exclusive Masonic jurisdiction over every male, Mason or not, within their domain. These efforts, in short, while protecting parochial interests, have been undeniably restrictive. In the past half century, serious challenges to the authority of Grand Lodges have been launched by individual Masons, by some highly placed leaders in the appendant and the uh, coordinate bodies, and by many who themselves lead or have led Grand Lodges. These challenges have caused the initiation of efforts to review Masonic laws and customs, particularly as they pertain to the concept of exclusive territorial jurisdiction, the so-called American doctrine, in several jurisdictions. In a number of Grand Lodges, in fact, long overdue policy changes have been contemplated and or implemented. It is therefore my purpose on this occasion to review the American doctrine, determine what it is and is not, to assess its applications, past and present, and to speculate to the degree that current developments will permit about a future that is by no means certain. Just what is this American doctrine of exclusive jurisdiction? At the outset, we should recognize that it is a settled principle of American Masonic practice, wherein it is proclaimed that Masonic and political jurisdiction is or should be coterminal. In other words, the boundaries which delimit the territory of a Grand Lodge should be the same as those which define the political limits of the state in which it exists. It logically follows that if a state should change its political boundaries, the Masonic boundaries of the Grand Lodge should also change in identical manner. Various sources claim that the American doctrine had its uh, origin in the developmental period coincidental with the American Revolution and its immediate aftermath. It was first enunciated as a principle, so far as I can determine, in New York in 1796. That Grand Lodge adopted a re resolution at that time to the effect that it would not charter any lodge outside the state in any place where another Grand Lodge was in existence. 
On September 13, 1797, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts adopted a resolution that stated the Grand Lodge would not hold any communication with or admit as visitors any Masons residing in the state who hold authority under and acknowledge the supremacy of any foreign Grand Lodge or who do not, uh, uh, by their representatives, communicate and pay dues to this Grand Lodge. The early New York resolution was given additional credence in 1866 by John W. Simmons, past Grand Master, who stated that the jurisdictional rights of the Grand Lodge do not extend beyond the boundaries of the country, state, and territory where it is located, except where a country is in Masonic terms vacant, that is, where there is no Grand Lodge established in it, in which case all the Grand Lodges in the world have concurrent jurisdiction there so far as they may deem it proper to be exercised. Simmons also stated, and I quote, when, however, a majority of the subordinates uh, choose to establish a Grand Lodge, then the territory is occupied. And not only are Grand Lodges in other states and countries forbidden to exercise any powers in the territory occupied by the new Grand Lodge, but their subordinates, if any, that may have refused to unite in the formation of the Grand Lodge are to be withdrawn and left subject to the disposition of local authority." End quote. This is a concept that Alphonse Sursa, writing in 1978, called the Doctrine of Comprehensive Jurisdiction, and it subsequently had application to Masonic developments that took place in Hawaii and in Alaska. It should be noted that the American doctrine has application only to the Grand Lodges of the United States. And even here it has not been appreciated consistently in the same manner at all times and at all places. Furthermore, it must be recognized that the American concept of exclusivity, starting with the growing concern of Grand Lodges over the issue of recognition in the mid to late 1830s, has been softened on occasion to permit the establishment or recognition of lodges and territories occupied by lawful Grand Lodges that have given their express consent or authorized permitted exceptions. Thus, the American Grand Lodges are unable to justify exceptions to the rule, domestic and foreign. The English interpretation of jurisdiction is quite different. The United Grand Lodge of England states only that it has sovereign jurisdiction over the lodges of its obedience that is, that a recognized Grand Lodge shall be responsible, independent, self-governing organization with sole and undisputed authority over the craft or over the symbolic degrees within its jurisdiction and that it shall not in any way be subject to or divide authority with a Supreme Council or other power claiming any control or supervision over those degrees. The Grand Lodges of England, Scotland, and Ireland have established lodges in the same countries in many parts of the world. It should be noted that these Grand Lodges emphasize control uh, over the lodges and over the degrees rather than over people and political entities. During the last quarter of the 18th century and through most of the 19th century, the Grand Lodges of the United States, growing in numbers and territorial extent, regarded the American doctrine, if they took cognizance of it at all, rather pragmatically. Their concern was to establish and perpetuate themselves at whatever cost 
was necessary. Hence, in many areas, violations or parochial interpretations of the American doctrine, as we know it today, were common. Among the exceptions commonly noted by scholars are those that are known to have occurred first in the District of Columbia, where Alexandria Washington Lodge No. 22, once located within the District of Columbia, was permitted at its own request to remain under the Grand Lodge of Virginia rather than subordinate itself to the Grand Lodge of D.C. Secondly, in Georgia, where two Grand Lodges existed from 1827 until the anti-Masonic movement put one out of existence and threatened to exterminate the other. Third, in Illinois, where the Grand Lodge of Illinois refused for some time to take jurisdiction over Western Star Lodge, the Lawrence Lodge, and Lebanon's Lodge, chartered by Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Tennessee, respectively, because they had not paid their dues to their chartering Grand Lodges. This Grand Lodge also allowed the Grand Lodge of Missouri to revoke the charter of Sangamon Lodge in Illinois for the non-payment of dues. Fourth, in Indian Territory, where Alpha Lodge, chartered by the Grand Lodge of Kansas, refused to join the Grand Lodge of the Indian Territory and was supported in that stand, uh, the question being not settled until 1878. Fifth, in Massachusetts, where there were two Grand Lodges until 1792, and where St. Andrew's Lodge of Boston continued to work under the Grand Lodge of Scotland until 1809. Six, in Louisiana, where it's impossible to say how often and how long duplication of Masonic authority existed. When the Grand Lodge of Mississippi deemed the Grand Lodge of Louisiana too erratic in its practices, it declared the Louisiana body spurious and proceeded to charter uh, lodges there. Seventh, in Minnesota, where the Grand Lodge chartered two lodges in uh, Dakota, uh, Dakota Territory, one before and one after the formation of the Grand Lodge in South Dakota in 1875. And the Grand Lodge of Minnesota defended its claim to these lodges until 1879. Eighth, in Missouri, where Bandalia Lodge, which was chartered in Illinois before the Grand Lodge of Illinois had been formed, appealed from a sentence pronounced by the Grand Lodge of Missouri suspending its charter, and the Grand Lodge of Missouri maintained jurisdiction in the case even after the Grand Lodge of Illinois had been formed. Ninth, also in Missouri, where the Grand Lodge uh, chartered St. Clair and Marion Lodges in Illinois in 1842, and kept two lodges in New Mexico on his rolls after the latter had been recognized by Missouri in 1877. When the Grand Lodge of Tennessee revoked the charter of one of its lodges in Missouri, however, Missouri held the action invalid for a reason that it alone had jurisdiction. Tenth, in New York, where two rival Grand Lodges existed between the years 1823, 1827, 1837, and 1850, and in 1853 through 1856. 11th, in South Carolina, where there were two Grand Lodges from 1787 until 1803. 12th, in West Virginia, where after the founding of the state and the creation of the Grand Lodge, several constituent lodges retained their charters from the Grand Lodge of Virginia and did not affiliate with the new Grand Lodge until it was required to do so by both jurisdictions. 
13th, in Washington State, where in 1897 the Grand Lodge reported recognition of African Grand Lodge, an act that resulted in the withdrawal of recognition of the Grand Lodge of Washington by several sister Grand Lodges, thereby inducing the Grand Lodge of Washington to rescind its action. And 14th and last, in Wisconsin, where in 1864, the Grand Lodge issued a dispensation for a lodge in Illinois near the state line, claiming the right because Illinois had not restrained Missouri for similar action. Now, in consequence of the inconsistent interpretation of jurisdictional mores at the Grand Lodge level, it is not surprising that some Grand Lodges outside the continental limits of the United States stood ready to take advantage of the situation. The exploits of two that did so, the Grand Lodge of Hamburg and the Grand Orient of France, have been duly chronicled in a number of Masonic sources. Apparently, the efforts of the Grand Lodge of Hamburg to interfere in American Freemasonry were less consequential and less lasting than were those of the Grand Orient. According to reports, the Grand Lodge of Hamburg recognized the Prince Hall Grand Lodges in Massachusetts and Ohio in 1874-75, an act that was considered tantamount to invasion at the time. It also directly instituted three lodges in New York, and by so doing, precipitated trouble that was to fester for many years in that jurisdiction. The meddling of the Grand Orient, however, was more serious. It, be it began in 1869 when the Grand Orient recognized a spurious body known as the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite in and for the sovereign and independent state of Louisiana. This body claimed jurisdiction over the craft degrees, as well as over those of the Scottish Rite. The explanation of the situation by the Grand Master of Louisiana precipitated action by his Grand Lodge to resolve that all Masonic correspondence and fraternal relations between his Grand Lodge and the Grand Orient of France cease and be discontinued, and that no Mason owing allegiance to that Grand Lodge be recognized in Louisiana. This action was supported widely, and the Grand Master of Pennsylvania on December 27, 1869 remarked, and I quote, the facts are so clear in this unjustifiable interference in Louisiana I deem it proper to state that all correspondence between the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and the Grand Orient of France should cease till the latter recalls its presumptuous intermeddling with the affairs of our sister Grand Lodge in Louisiana and yields assent to that paramount principle of the supreme sovereignty of Grand Lodges of Freemasons in the United States." End quote. By these words, the Grand Master of Pennsylvania established a prophetic uh, precedent which would prove useful at a latter date in his own jurisdiction. In 1924, the Grand Orient of France struck again by sponsoring in Pennsylvania the ancient and accepted Scottish rite of universal Freemasonry in Pennsylvania, a body which claimed the right to confer all degrees. One of the peculiar provisions of the agreement between the Grand Orient and this spurious body was that which gave the latter the right to institute new lodges in the United States. The warrants to be issued by the Grand Orient thus virtually constituted the new body a provincial or district Grand Lodge under the Grand uh, Orient of France. It further provided that the Pennsylvania Council was not to create lodges in any state having 
a grand lodge with which the Grand Orient was in fraternal relations. At the conclusion of a report on the situation presented by the chairman of the committee appointed to study the matter, the Grand Lodge resolved that the Grand Secretary forward to each of the Grand Lodges of the United States a copy of the report calling their attention to the fact that the body which the Grand Orient of France has taken under its wings is authorized by the Grand Orient of France to create lodges in every state excepting Alabama, Iowa, Missouri, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, and that its power is extended to those states when the fraternal relations now exist between the several Grand Lodges there and the Grand Orient of France shall cease. The resolve also respectfully and confidently asked its, its sister jurisdictions to adopt those views as fundamental principles of masonry and, and requested those Grand Lodges which were still in fraternal relation with the Grand Lodge of France to give their adherence to those views in several relations. Having made two approaches in loss, the Grand Orient continued to attempt to extend its influence in this country. In 1989, I was Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. At that time, a member of the Grand Orient called on me in my office. It was a courtesy call initiated by him, and the visit at first was very pleasant. We had a spirited discussion of our differences and of those basic factors which continue to make mutual recognition uh, impossible. Eventually, however, the conversation took a different turn when my visitor invited me to visit his lodge. I responded to the effect that my vows made this impossible. I also remarked that I had only been in Paris once in my life and that I could not foresee another visit in the immediate future. His reply shocked me. To the best of my recognition, he said that uh, a visit to Paris was not necessary because his lodge was operating in Georgetown, a subdivision of the city of Washington, D.C. I reacted with more emotion than with sense, I fear, scolding him for his audacity and breaching the rules of Masonic propriety. I was so incensed, in fact, that I never did learn exactly when or where in Georgetown this illegal lodge uh, was meeting. During the course of the past two decades, the concept of the American doctrine has been imaginatively interpreted to facilitate actions that have led to the sharing of the state of Alaska by two Grand Lodges, to the establishment, temporarily at least, of, Grand, of the Grand Lodge of Iran in Massachusetts, and to the sharing of territory in a number of states uh, by regular Grand Lodges and the Prince Hall Grand Lodges in the same jurisdictions. Each of these developments are attributable to the creative application of the American doctrine and are thus worthy of comment. Masonry in Alaska was under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Washington until 1981. In that year, at a convention of lodges called in advance for the purpose, 12 of Alaska's 19 lodges, all chartered by the Most Worshipful Grand Lodge of Washington, voted to form the Grand Lodge of Alaska. A code was adopted, copied mostly from the Washington Masonic Code, 
declaring exclusive territorial jurisdiction within the state of Alaska and allowing the seven lodges voting no to retain their Washington charters as long as they wished. Five of the lodges voting no were located in southeast Washington, where a strong feeling of apartness and difference from the rest of the state had existed since the territory of Alaska was first populated. In a report to the Conference of Grand Masters, Alaskan authorities stated that the people of the southeast looked and traveled south to Washington rather than north to the rest of the state. This example of historical sectionalism was slow to die, and it was a decade or more before some lodges in the south affiliated with the new Grand Lodge of Alaska. Now the division of authority by regular Grand Lodges in Alaska was unquestionably unique in American Freemasonry. Furthermore, approval of the process that divided subordinate lodges there between two Grand Lodges stands in stark contrast to the procedure that was followed in Hawaii just eight years later. In the latter instance, the Grand Lodge of California, whose position in Hawaii was analogous to that of the Grand Lodge of Washington in Alaska, held that the creation of a Grand Lodge of Hawaii would necessitate the subordination to it of all of the lodges in Hawaii without exception. Another instance in which territory was, in, was voluntarily shared to a degree occurred in Massachusetts in 1985 when the Grand Lodge of Iran in exile was authorized to operate there. The Commission on Information and for Recognition in commenting on this development stated that it recognized that the American doctrine of territorial jurisdiction is subject to exceptions, one of which is an agreement on a part of the Grand Lodge located in a territory that another Grand Lodge may operate within that territory. It also stated that the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, being a sovereign Grand Lodge, had the right to grant to the Grand Lodge of Iran approval to meet in Massachusetts. Finally, the Commission claimed it was advised that any Iranian nationals who were to be made Masons in Massachusetts under uh, the Grand Lodge of Iran uh, were to be subject to that uh, Grand Lodge and no other. While there had been, has been general approval of the charitable motives of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts in extending a helping hand uh, to the Grand Lodge of Iran in exile, the act, at least at first, did not receive universal approval. In fact, a number of Grand Lodges hesitated to take action to recognize the Grand Lodge of Iran in exile. And a number of Masonic leaders privately expressed concern about how and where the petitions of candidates of Iranian nationality as stipulated in the Massachusetts order were being obtained. Many Grand Lodges took their rules concerning residence to heart. Now, uh, no discussion of the sharing of territorial jurisdiction would be complete without reference to developments in a majority of the United States Grand Lodges to establish relations with their Prince Hall counterparts. The movement had its origin in the early failed attempts of recognition uh, initiated by the Grand Lodges of Washington in 1898 and Massachusetts in 1947. Severe criticism of the decisions on Prince Hall reached in those Grand Lodges quickly forced reversal of positions in both instances. 
In 1989, however, a new movement to that end was initiated by the Grand Lodge of Connecticut, which recognized the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in that jurisdiction for visitation purposes. In the period 1989 through 2011, according to information presented in Paul Bessel's website, a total of 41 regular U.S. Grand Lodges have now established full or partial recognition of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge operating within what was at one time exclusive territory. In that website, Brother P Bessel states that he has documentation to attest to full recognition by 30 regular Grand Lodges, but he believes that to the total may be as many as 37. Four regular Grand Lodges, according to Bessel, have agreed to limited recognition without uh, intervisitation of their Prince Hall counterparts. But he suggested that two of these may have since modified their stands on that issue. In reaction to the developments relative to Prince Hall Masonry in the United States, some Grand Lodges early on deemed it appropriate to respond negatively some by edict and some by simple resolution. Nevertheless, of the ten regular jurisdictions which have not as yet established relations with their Prince Hall counterparts, none have permitted their position on that issue to unduly complicate their relations with other members of the regular Grand Lodge community. They have simply employed the American doctrine to sustain and justify their position. A concluding word on the issue of Prince Hall recognition may be useful. For the most part, Prince Hall lodges are separated, one from the other along state lines, not unlike other Grand Lodges. But there are significant exceptions. In addition to the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Oregon, several other Prince Hall Grand Lodges extend across state lines. Those that do include the Prince Hall Grand Lodges of Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Washington, and Virginia. Moreover, several Prince Hall Grand Lodges have extensive networks of military lodges overseas. Hence, it is possible that this factor alone, the nonconformity of administrative boundaries, may in time complicate interjurisdictional relations. When I first wrote this paper on territorial juris jurisdiction two decades ago, I stated A, that the doctrine as originally conceived no longer existed. B, that the historic application of the doctrine, especially in the 19th century, had been selective. C, that inconsistent applications of the doctrine had encouraged challenge. And D, when prudent, I said that Grand Lodges had modified their interpretations of the doctrine to satisfy challenges at hand. I was convinced at that time that the oncoming tidal wave of Prince Hall recognitions by regular Grand Lodges would expeditiously negate the doctrine of exclusive territorial jurisdiction. In that judgment, I was partially correct, as indicated by remarks made in this presentation. But on the basis of afterthought, I must acknowledge that in suggesting an early demise of the doctrine of exclusive territorial jurisdiction, I was wrong. To this day, that concept continues to thrive as a significant principle governing interjurisdictional relations among all regular Grand Lodges in this country. The recognition of Prince Hall Grand Lodges has in no instance 
led to the renouncement of the doctrine by any regular Grand Lodge. As a matter of fact, the doctrine continues to be injected into interjurisdictional disputes as they arise, and there appears to be almost total agreement in regular Grand Lodge circles on the jurisdictional primacy of all regular Grand Lodges over its candidates, members, and its lodges, and not infrequently, despite the recognition of Prince Hall uh, counterparts over all male residents within claimed domains. Thus, while many of our regular Grand Lodges have indisputably agreed to the sharing of territory with counterpart Prince Hall Grand Lodges, like concessions, except for border area protocols, continue to be denied regular Grand Lodges in this country. Hopefully, as in the Prince Hall issue, our, our regular Grand Lodges will continue to prove amenable to the circumvention of custom whenever it is apparent that it isn't in their interest to do so. Change, my brethren, after all, is an inevitable constant in American Freemasonry. Thank you for your attention.